Hello everyone and welcome back to ADAP, our course on Advanced Object-Oriented Design and Programming. In the last session we looked at design by contract, a way of describing, specifying the relationship between classes and also what to do when the contract is broken, which is to signal an error. And this is today's topic, the topic of this session, error and exception handling. So we will need to look at the common bug that causes errors, have a system model, have a conceptual understanding what happens in error and exception handling, which is error detection, signaling or escalation and handling. And going back to the system model, we need to look at how at different levels of granularity we deal with errors and eventually failures, in particular at the boundaries of components. The terminology I use is uh, based on R.V. Zienis at Alii, uh, the article referenced here, but I will only pick out a particular aspect mostly dealing with software bugs or faults in your source code which have been inadvertently, non-maliciously, innocently introduced, meaning you simply made a mistake by programming. So there's no attempt at cracking here. It's simply bugs and bugs just happen. How do they happen? Well, if you uh, they happen during development time, maybe you're hurried, maybe you didn't think it through, maybe what you write doesn't actually mean what you think it does. It's just human nature to make mistakes while programming. So at development time, you write code, faulty code, and that's a fault in the code. That's a software fault. At runtime then, faults, if they get triggered, lead to error or erroneous states of the system. So the difference is fault is what happens at development time, your bug, and error is what happens at runtime. Here is a made up example of particularly bad code. So I made it up to not blame anyone. And you can see how this method, which is supposed to read an integer from a file, does really just a lot of bad things. It's in particular really bad with respect to error handling. Uh, it seems to throw an exception if something's wrong, but when you look at it, the exception of the code the exception, such exception is never actually uh, thrown. There is some internal catching of an exception, but that's just swallowed with do nothing here. And that is even worse because uh, you, there is a problem and it's not being signaled to the outside world. Instead, the return value, the integer is overloaded with either the, uh, the re proper result or the integer being read from the file or an error code. It's not even clear whether a return value actually is an error code or minus one or the integer that was read from the file. So this is completely poor, unusable code. Don't do it, obviously. And this was for illustration purposes only. Anyway, looking at last session uh, from a design by contract perspective, this was also lacking. There was no declaration of preconditions or no assertion of preconditions. Uh, there was no cleanup after, this, after the method ran and so forth. And then all the things wrong with respect to error and exception handling that I just mentioned. So the question in front of us is bugs happen. We can't really prevent that because bugs are human, because it's humans who program. So if they are inevitable, what do we do? How do we handle it? How do we make systems more dependable than uh, previously possible than possible without looking at dependability and handling of bugs? To get there, we need to have a conceptual model of a system, introduce some terminology so we can intelligently talk about what happens when errors occur and need to be signaled and so forth. So a system in this lecture is uh, a whole system and is comprised of uh, components. Uh, the system has a boundary or an interface. 
the components within the system, the multiple components within the system have interfaces uh, that can be called upon and where they, where they call out to other components using their interfaces, etc. So we will talk about components and systems where the components provide services through the interfaces that get called upon and uh, there can be erroneous states and eventually service provision failures when a component does not deliver what it promised through its interface. A fault is something that can cause an error. So it's not the error itself yet. It's not the erroneous state, but rather it is something that can cause it. In software terms, uh, in programmers terms, the software fault is the common bug, something wrong in your code. Other forms of faults would be uh, poor user input that leads the system into an erroneous uh, state. But we care about a programmer making a mistake since that is so common and then the question becomes how to deal with it. The fault is in the code and that's where it resides. Uh, it may not actually be bad if the code is never executed. It doesn't matter that there's a fault. But of course, um, it is waiting to be executed. So if the code runs and the fault triggers, and then it leads to an error, meaning an erroneous system state that can later on lead to a failure. So if the error uh, has been detected, uh, that was caused by a fault, the error has been detected, then it's an error. If it has not yet been detected, but was already caused by the fault, then the error is latent. It has not yet been detected, a latent error. And then if you have an erroneous state and uh, that's still possibly salvageable, we can handle the error and maybe fix things. But if that's not possible any longer, then uh, the error turned or is turned into a failure as we give up trying to provide the service that we wanted to provide. So uh, after an error follows possibly uh, a failure to provide the service uh, that can be categorized, that could be a functionality that's not doing what it's supposed to do. It could simply be unavailability or crashing of the system. It could be corruption of data and so forth. There are many different ways of how the error eventually manifests itself as a failure. And all of that is embedded in a process. So here you see an illustration of some software fault. The control flow passes by the faulty code. The fault gets activated, meaning it creates the poor, the, the buggy code, creates an error in the data. So now there's an erroneous state of the system. And initially, the system doesn't even notice, perhaps, so uh, it keeps running. But eventually, it's uh, detected. And uh, with the error being detected, we will see that you should or the system should switch into a different state of processing in which it tells the caller, the context that wanted some function, uh, that there is now an error. Um, and it propagates the error uh, back the call chain. Basically, the error is some code along the way will try to fix the error, but if it can't be fixed, it keeps getting propagated back the call chain until it reaches the first component boundary, where, which is probably actually where the recovery from the error first is tried. But if that component boundary uh, cannot make the component recover from the error, then a service failure or component failure has to be signaled. So now we are switching from the uh, manifested error uh, into a real service uh, failure to provide the service and escalate that and signal that to the calling component because systems are made of multiple components. The calling component now views the received component failure as an error. So we go back to an error. Uh, the component tries to fix it, but if it can't, it also propagates back to that second component's interface where if it cannot be fixed again, then a failure is signaled 
at the end of the chain typically to a human so the human eventually sees on the screen some form of notification that the service has failed to provide what it uh, what it um, promised to do um, ideally that is a very deliberate display of a service failure in the form of we failed to deliver the service for this and that reason but very often you also just see on a screen just basically database not available or even a, a stack trace in poorly designed applications which don't capture any such such uh, failure well and simply escalate it to the user in technical terms which for non-technical users might as well be gibberish. So this whole process that I just sketched out at the core has an error handling uh, strategy or process where first the error, the erroneous state of the system needs to be detected and then after detection it gets signaled to those who asked for the functionality where the error occurred, it gets signaled or escalated until it reaches a place where the error can actually be handled. So the place where the error is detected is not necessarily the place where the error can be handled. So in between the error needs to be passed on and that's the signaling. So now I will talk about these three steps or stages in sequence. First, how to detect an error then how to signal a detected error and finally how to handle an error before then again we look at component failure. So first step is error detection. Uh, how, do you detect, how do you detect an error? Um, there are multiple ways. Uh, you may just program like you think are you testing for something you think might be useful but more professionally you do think or should think about your classes in an object-oriented system as being part of design by contract formed or based relationships so you look at the um, preconditions usually meaning the obligations put on clients uh, when they utilize a method you look at the preconditions that leads to and the service being provided and those preconditions typically uh, are good then for identifying errors usually in the parameters and uh, what is um, what is uh, ensuring on the one hand that the client properly performs its duties is on the outgoing side the assurance that the method itself provided its service so use the post conditions or let the client check that uh, the deliverables that the job was done correctly by the method being called so basically you use the assertions that design by contract uh, let you uh, come up with and that's exactly also how not only you detect it but also where you effectively uh, turn the processing around from the, as I mentioned before, but we'll discuss later again, from the normal to the abnormal state. So if you are applying design by contract, you already have pretty much all the error detection in place for software bugs. Um, so again, it's failing preconditions or postconditions or class invariants. It's really helpful to think about it in terms of is this method providing the service it, it promised to or not? And so don't switch over to defensive programming, stick with design by contract and your identification, your detection of errors will remain lean. Here's uh, an example that we already know. The code you might write in an insert method of a name class, homogeneous name class, and it's the assertion methods which on the one hand ensure the client did its job right by providing correct proper arguments to the method and then also the post conditions by which the by which the um, method ensures that it does its job uh, well and you can see that i'm also asserting class invariance at least at the end of the method meaning as the 
control flow leaves this method and the object uh, we are testing or asserting that the object is in a valid uh, state. So all of these are methods that make assertions and if the assertions fail, we just detect it at runtime and error. So once we are in that code, in that uh, test in the assertion method or with the assert statement, where we are now going to, for example, create an exception. More generally, what we need to do is we need to capture the information about the error we just detected. And so conceptually, what we need is uh, some ID for the error. So that's the specific error instance, uh, some ID for that perhaps. Uh, we need to note uh, the type of the error. Now, if you have exception objects, then the type of the error is in the class of the except exception you choose. But if you're just returning error codes or error objects, you may not be so object-oriented and it may have to be noted separately. You want to carry around information to make it helpful or possible to interpret the error. So the source of uh, the error, the objects uh, that the test ran on may have to be added to the error information, any objects that may have been affected in case there are salvage opportunities or attempts later, and uh, maybe some good message that makes sense that explains what the code just found. Uh, to a human who can then read it and perhaps more easily debug the problem. In the way how I talk about this, it always seems to be implied that using exceptions is the best way of capturing error information and also handling errors. And that's true, but it is not the only uh, way of going about error handling. Uh, many programming languages don't have proper exception handling, so you have to pass around error objects or error codes as the result of detecting an error. And that is its own code and strategy that you also need to understand. So um, here's just a typical assertion method, the well-known assert as valid index and the error being detected by the test here, the invalid index leads to the creation of an exception object and that it's being thrown, meaning you switch over into exception uh, processing mode. Um, so the error information is the exception object. And as you know, in Java, you can create new subclasses of existing exception classes and capture all the necessary information. So the type is in the class you choose. You should have an ID that could be the object ID itself or maybe some separate uh, string. And then you have the source objects, effective obje effective, affected objects, and maybe or hopefully good human readable messages to help people debug the system. In addition to passing on, uh, detecting the error and creating error information, you may also want to log that an error occurred. It's a secondary measure. Um, the runtime, the error will get escalated, but at the very moment, the first moment where the error occurred, you may want to log it. So you have a second way of debugging it. And so into the error log, you write that the error occurred, even though you're still processing it. So now we have an error object because we detected an error and then we logged that error. But detecting an error doesn't mean we know what to do about it. And uh, if we didn't write any code to handle the error right in place, which is what you which is rather common, then we need to at least signal the error or escalate the error up the call chain um, so that later or callers, uh, earlier callers and to which control flow returns, uh, meaning those who have a higher level perspective on the code because it's them who wanted the function that they can handle and decide what it means that they're not getting the service from the system that they wanted. So in order to get there, we need to signal or escalate uh, 
uh, the error. So after logging, we need to signal it. And uh, effectively signaling means you are leaving the normal state of processing. So there is an error, it was detected. And rather than proceed with the main function, you now have to return to the caller and inform them about the error uh, using your error object. And this is really hard if the programming language doesn't support it well. Uh, conceptually, it means your system is in one, switches from one state to another. So normally, your normal program state where you are, where the code is running, the methods are performing its duties as planned. And you return after you did your work to your caller simply by, by the return statement or by reaching the end of a method. Now, an abnormal program state where uh, there was a error detected, you also need to return the control flow to the caller, but it needs to be clear to the caller that this is a, not a normal return from normal processing, but that you that an error occurred and that it needs to take care of it. And so if you have exception handling, you do that by throwing an exception because that by support of the programming languages already makes you look at a specific section of the code that's dedicated only to erroneous situations. But if you don't have that, then you need to use something like error codes to deal with it, which are appear like they are in the normal uh, control flow. So there's only one mode and you always have to ha distinguish between uh, uh, are you logically in the abnormal program state and carve out specific code sections that deal with the abnormal state while you actually go through normal processing. So if that, that is the case, then if you simply return and return by error codes, so your return values maybe are error codes, that's the common way. Um, and uh, so there is no switch in processing state but rather you just return and some values that you want, hope that the caller checks for uh, have been set to indicate the abnormal state processing that should take place within the caller. So that could be done by a return value, an error code you return as a return value. It could also be in, uh, in a method argument. So the error codes could be provided to callers by referenced objects that you receive as method arguments could be a wholly separate object that gets configured a mailbox object perhaps or that get configured to receive the error information and then the caller always has to check that separate mailbox object all the time don't you dare forget or you will not understand or notice that you're an abnormal processing straight state so that's why it's so much better if you can already program write code that explicitly separates the abnormal processing state from the normal processing state. And then, of course, that's what you do by uh, raising an exception, throwing it and capturing it, uh, catching it in the caller uh, calling method. So then the error information specifically is in the exception object itself that is caught uh, by the caller. So let's have a simple, simple exercise. Um, how could this, uh, how could this possibly look like for a simple read method um, that that fills a buffer uh, uh, with a number of bytes, and where of course things can, could go wrong. What are the different ways of doing that? So here is uh, how it looks like if you use error codes. So there is no programming language feature. I'm assuming which lets you separate normal from abnormal processing state. There's only one, uh, one regular control flow. So you can see here uh, how it's still object oriented. There's a class file. Now there are the indicators of which processing state you are in. If, some indic if the indicator in the form of an integer has the value no error equals zero here, then you're in normal processing state. But if the indicating variable 
uh, has a value other than zero, like error and a file or parity error, then you are logically in abnormal processing state. So first there's the read bytes method, which gets a buffer variable into which is written. And then there's a number of bytes that are supposed to be written into the buffer. So it's not very efficient here. I'm making it simple, keeping it simple. Um, the read bytes method simply uh, calls number times to a read byte method, which reads an individual single byte. And now, uh, as the read bytes method relies on the read byte method, we can see how we handle potential errors by the in the read bytes method. So something could go wrong in the read byte method, and that would be signaled by the return value being not equal to no error. So you can see how I'm reading a byte and uh, I'm testing, checking the return code, whether it indicates an error, is an error code, indicates an error. So we would return to the caller itself of read bytes with that error code. If we finish without problems, we simply return no error as the return value. Again, no separate abnormal processing state, just normal processing, presumably. But in the return values is the indication of whether this state should be considered conceptually abnormal or normal. Of interest here is that because there is no dedicated separate programming language mechanism, we have the problem of needing two results really from the method. We want to have the buffer change data read into it, but we also need the error codes. We don't have two return variables. We only have one and we use it for the error code. So the read byte method provides a reference of the buffer into which is written, which is somewhat counterintuitive. If you have a method and it has a purpose to do something and that re then return that to you, you'd rather have the result of the method be the return value rather than an error code. So you'd rather have the buffer be the return value of the method. But you can't do that if you have uh, separately error codes to return to and you choose the return value, the return type to be the error codes. When you look at the read byte method, you can see how I'm testing for various erroneous states. And if they are there, then an error code is returned to indicate the error. Here is how it would look like with exceptions. So there is the read bytes method again. No need for a buffer because, because that will be the return value. You can see byte array as a return value. And uh, the only argument read bytes gets is the number of bytes to read. So in the core of the method signature byte array, read bytes and no, is nothing about error codes. The error handling is programmed, mentioned separately by the exception that could be thrown. And that makes much more sense because a much, you have a much cleaner separation now between, uh, between the functionality under normal processing, returns, byte array, uh, read bytes and no, and the abnormal situation throws IO exception. And so here uh, the method implementation even gets simpler. Um, we create a buffer as a result. We read byte by byte into it by calling the read byte method, read the next byte, and uh, that's it. It's even so simple that we just pass on, or let, let just pass through any exception that comes from the subordinate read byte method. When you look at the read bytes method, there is no exception being created in there. We just let an exception pass from the read byte method. So in the read byte method, the erroneous situation, the error is identified, detected, and then the error information is collected in an exception object, and then is signaled by throwing the exception. All of that in the read byte method. And the read bytes method only lets the exception pass through, meaning it just does not get in the way of signaling. It doesn't catch it, doesn't rethrow it. 
and so it's also it's not detecting it's just letting it's just signaling by not doing anything about it so the caller to read bytes now receives the io exception and has to deal with it and so again it's much cleaner code in that the exception the error detection that leads to the exception object um, in terms of code is not interfering with the normal processing. Still, error codes are very common. Um, here are some conventions. Zero typically means that there was no error. Yoo-hoo. Minus one is the generic error. Something's wrong, but, uh, but um, we can't tell you any specifics. And positive values, uh, one and larger, typically indicate specific uh, errors. 404, zum Beispiel, for example. So, um, really, exceptions are generally better um, because they have, if you have an exception handling mechanism built into the programming language again, because they really separate normal and abnormal program state more nicely from each other. Um, and that's what they are good for. That's how they were designed. So, use exceptions to switch from normal to abnormal processing state. The inverse also holds true. Don't use exceptions to, to make regular returns. I hope nobody ever did, though occasionally you see it. It's really bad style to use exceptions for normal processing. You really shouldn't do that if you wanted to uh, escalate something. Uh, it's just a really bad strategy. So then we detected errors and created an error information object, ideally in the form of an exception. And then we signaled that exception, uh, that error, uh, ideally by using exception, uh, by throwing an exception, signaling the exception, and thereby visibly for the programmer and the runtime visibly switching into the abnormal processing state. And so signaling, signaling, escalation, escalation is taking place. And now hopefully we reach a state where someone, someone can handle the error. So here you can see a state model of what's happening in error uh, detection and so forth. So first of all, you are in NPS, the normal processing state on the left, and you're processing and processing, you're calling methods and everything's fine. Then you detect an error. And then you signal the error, and thereby you switch over into the, um, uh, into the uh, abnormal processing state. Now, um, you can escalate that, and you do so until um, until uh, you identify until you reach a place where you decide counter where you uh, choose counteraction so counteraction means that uh, you try to do something about it you don't let's just let the exception pass so you decide for example it's a false alarm and switch back to normal processing mode just try again um, you can uh, deliberately try again by not just ignoring the alarm as a false alarm uh, but by uh, setting a counter for multiple retries so you are just assuming it was a transient error and not a fundamental error so you just try again but maintain that counter and uh, uh, you switch back to normal processing state and see whether you get the problem again so this way you switch back and forth between normal processing and abnormal processing. So here again are the three things that you can do after you detected, uh, detected an error. You signal and escalate, you identify it as a false alarm, or you try again. So going back to um, to our exercise, how would you handle the uh, an error signal by the by the file class? We have a document that's trying to read its content from a file, and so it therefore uses the uh, read bytes method 
uh, from the file in order to reconstruct the document object in memory. And naturally, as you probably know, as I'm sure you've programmed with exceptions before, you bracket the call uh, to the read bytes file where you know abnormal processing state could be reached, meaning you there might be the signaling of an error. You bracket it in a try uh, clause, try catch clause. And that's what you have to write. So um, you write deliberate code um, that catches any switch to the abnormal state with its own code section. In Java, you have to write that code section in the catch block and close to, close to, usually the methods that cause the switch to abnormal state. You could also try moving them to the end of uh, the method. Some programming languages syntactically let you handle that a bit nicer in that you really cleanly separate the normal processing at the top of the method from the abnormal processing at the bottom of the method. In Java, it does get a mixed a little bit because the catch is in the middle of normal processing code. But it's still so much better to have exception handling like this rather than have none. So here's an example where I'm trying to resume uh, by tries. So there are three, tie, three tries, assuming that the initial errors could be transient. And uh, there are three tries, retries of reading the bytes for the from the file to construct the document object. But after the third try, they give up. So you can see how there is a switchback from abnormal processing to normal processing while you're still retrying. That's the resumption. But eventually you have to give up on that and program that as well. So if there were three tries and they all failed, then you do have to throw another document exception. So now you're wrapping the failure, uh, the, the error of the uh, of the method you called in a new exception object. That's common, you're wrapping, wrapping, wrapping the exceptions and that also expresses the chain of signaling, attempts at handling, failing at handling, signaling again, attempts at handling, failing at handling and so forth. As you escalate, maybe as you fail at handling and further escalate uh, the error, you should clean up after you. So try to uh, clean up as much as you can because even though the system remains in an erroneous state, doesn't mean that the resources you might be using or have used uh, can be left uh, unclean. Uh, try to free up, try to get the objects into as clean a state as possible because the callers uh, might try to resume. Uh, so the resumption might take place. Um, but eventually you uh, have to give up and so forth. So clean up, um, again, release relevant resources, uh, look at class invariants, uh, try to restore the invariants to true so that the objects are in valid state, like possibly rolling them back to before the method uh, call that caused the uh, switch to abnormal state that where the fault triggered the error, led to the error, and so forth. So in Java, uh, that is quite interesting, you actually have a choice of exceptions. So it should be clear by now that you should be using exceptions to signal abnormal processing state, but you may wonder which of the two types of exceptions you should be using. A checked exception in Java is one that must be declared in the method signature. So if a method can throw an exception, you might have an exception coming out of that method, and it is a checked type of exception, then it needs to be declared in the method signature. This forces the caller to deal with it explicitly. Um, many, many programmers hate that. Many programmers want to program their main functionality and ignore errors and exceptions and the abnormal processing state. 
So they really dislike uh, checked exceptions. But as a professional programmer, you simply need to realize that errors can take place. And that's a separate section of the code you're writing. So um, checked exceptions are not necessarily bad. Um, when do you... Uh, so I think in theory, at least, you should always use checked exceptions. Uh, except that from a pragmatic perspective, people hate it so much that they usually switch to unchecked exceptions. So unchecked exceptions are exceptions that you do not need to declare in the method signature. That lets you um, write code that focuses on the business functionality. And if you throw that exception in the method, the client code it does not have to take notice of it. It just gets passed through the client code. So it passes just by by the client. Whoosh! Uh, the exception passed through and escalated up the chain. And as you're programming client code, you somewhat like that because you just want to get again your business function done with the help of other methods. And you don't want to think about the abnormal processing state but as a professional programmer you really should now there is there is a compromise here uh, and the compromise is systems are built from more coarse grain components than just objects so if you have a system where you have an understanding of components then make the component boundary the place where the checked exceptions occur and within the component you can have the unchecked exceptions so within the component you may have an escalation all through all calls in the call chain where you ignore them uh, you're not taking care of it but at the boundary of the component you need to catch it and turn it into a checked exception because that's where you signal signal your client that something went wrong. So as just stated, um, we have these at least two levels of granularity where we look at systems. There are the individual objects that do stuff together, but then objects are assembled into components, uh, services, larger, more coarse grain uh, entities and ideally they have an interface so that's the domain of software architecture pure objects are usually too fine grain and don't make good architecture models you assemble multiple objects into some sort of service or component and then there is a difference whether somewhere some object fails or a whole component fails and the notion of breaking down a software system into components gives us the leverage and the place where to put the error handling code and the switch over from unchecked to checked exceptions in a good place where it does not get in the way of the programmer but still the important uh, effect is there that the exceptions are not passed by completely unnoticed you do want to not ignore exceptions so a component failure is really uh, a failure of the component is a, some, as a failure to handle an error. So if you cannot handle an error, then it leads to the failure of that component. And uh, that is something that needs to be signaled explicitly. So in the interface of a component, you should not, you should declare all exceptions that could come out of your component and you should make them obviously then checked exceptions so that the calling components see in this coarse grain interface see actually all the things that could go wrong and that is because different components are often developed by different people you as the programmer of one component may know all the unchecked exceptions that you let just let you pass by but users of your component, which may be other people, want to explicitly see the potential exceptions that come out of your code. And the way to do that is checked exceptions. If the user decides to turn the checked exception into an unchecked exception and further escalate it out 
their own component, so be it. But you did your job by having a nicely, cleanly defined interface with the exceptions identifying the possible abnormal state that the control flow might leave your component from. So do not let an unchecked exception escape. There's a corollary to that because there should only be a checked exceptions. Here you can see it again. Uh, there is the uh, initial bottom left, normal processing state, an error is detected and signaled, and it is escalated using unchecked exceptions until the, it reaches the original entry point to the component where it's decided that it cannot be handled, sadly, and it's not further passed on as an unchecked exceptions, but at the component boundary, just behind the boundary, behind the interface, still in the service, the exception is turned into a checked exception and escalated to the calling client. This way, you do not fool the client. You are very explicit about you cannot fulfill the contract the service interface, and now it's in the abnormal processing state of the client which then might try to handle it, maybe returns to normal processing and calls the service again. But because it's a component boundary, you do not let an unchecked exception escape from your component and thereby you have a clean interface. So then um, you have switched from an error that you detected and signaled but couldn't handle uh, within a set of escalations of objects within a component. Now you have a failure to provide the component service. It's similar to an error, but the whole point is that you are now at a component level, aggregates of objects, and that makes it closer to the human and the architecture, and we talk about failures then rather than errors. So the failure uh, to provide the service. Like for error signaling, you should try to clean up the component as much as you can, restore the invariant, release resources, etc., and prepare for later possible re-entry or retry. And then you escalate uh, the failure, but this time, unlike error exceptions, uh, unlike with the unchecked exceptions of error escalation, the failure escalation should always be a checked exception. And um, within that checked exception, you probably will have the exception chain of the unchecked exception that you caught and turned into that checked exception. And then the calling client to your service component has the relevant information on what to possibly do. I kind of gratuitously, gratuitously <laughs> assumed that components are obvious. Um, maybe they are not, but uh, the layers, um, uh, the, the tiers, I wanted to say, of uh, an architecture are often good component boundaries. So, for example, a persistent layer, the way where you, the way, the layer in the code, I'm sorry, the tier in the code where you save your objects, make a nice boundary. And so that would be tied to object manager and photo manager, they are the main interface to the persistence subsystem or persistency component. And um, how would you deal with that? Uh, looking at Valside now, if the photo manager class is tasked with reading a photo of ID so and so, but something goes wrong, how to, how to handle that? Yep, so think about it in terms of the terminology we set up, error detection, error signaling and escalation, uh, error handling, attempts at error handling, maybe failing, so leading to failure at the component boundary of photo manager and so forth. Well, here's a summary of how it could look like. You catch the error, perhaps from the storage layer, maybe something like the file is corrupt or the database keeps resetting the connection, what have you, and you try to perhaps handle the error in place, but uh, you couldn't, and that's when the error gets manifest from latent to, to uh, manifest, and you switch to signaling. So you capture all the error information, and uh, with good Java programming would 
put it into an unchecked exception object that you throw uh, to your client. So you signal the error by way of exception, throwing an unchecked exception. It get X escalated. Eventually someone should feel responsible for catching that unchecked exception. And the last place where that should happen if all others ignore it is at the component boundary, meaning in photo manager. So photo manager should capture all unchecked exceptions. Um, maybe they have a way of resumption, a way of trying to handle the error, but if not, they should wrap it into a component specific exception that is a checked exception, throw that checked exception to its caller and then let the caller decide how to go about the failure to provide the service. If it escalates along multiple components all the way to the user interface, well, then the caller, the final caller is the user, that's the client, and the user interface, if you will, is the final system boundary. So you can display to this, in that case, a checked exception will not be helpful, uh, but you have to turn it into something human readable. You are also logging it, of course, but you should con Word what otherwise would have been or you should present what otherwise would have been a checked exception into uh, a human readable form and that you display to the user so they can take appropriate action. So good components do as what I just uh, what I just said if you are facing components from libraries that that you are not so sure about that have some sort of error handling strategy or maybe not and it's not at all clear and it's just a mixture of error codes and exceptions and checked and unchecked exceptions and you're just left scratching your head then maybe you have to wrap it so you have to look at it and you have to wrap the methods and write code that all where all it does is to analyze the return values and decide what that means from the uh, perspective of normal versus abnormal processing state and converts those uh, returned and the returned information into something that matches your error and exception handling strategy, which you follow afterwards. Here's the final word on exceptions. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so we talked about the common bug and the system model you need to think about bugs in systems and how to talk about it, which led us straight to the, escalate, the steps of error detection, error signaling and error handling. And then we observed that there are at least two levels of granularity. One is those where you have unchecked exceptions within a component and one where you have checked exceptions uh, which indicate failure to provision to provide a service which is on the granularity level of components and that's where you again should switch to checked exceptions in general exception handling is much better than providing error codes with that thank you very much for your time and attention and see you in the next session